everybody. Our speaker today is uh, Brother Brian Nichols. Yeah. So I'm thankful that he took the responsibility and he will bring the message for us this morning. Let's open our scripture reading on Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. Scripture of Revelation 1, 7, 1 to 3. You have your Bible open? Let's read, okay? Revelation 7, 1 to 3. Okay? And after these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on the trees. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servant of our God in their forehead. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. All right. So first off, um, of course, we lost our brother Alan. And uh, I, I just want to say it was a pleasure to get to know him in the brief time that I was able to share with him. Um, ironically enough, we had a really wonderful conversation just last Sabbath in the fellowship hall. Uh, of course, not realizing that would be the last time I talked to him. It was still uh, very impactful. And, um, you know, I guess I have maybe a weird view on death because I'm actually happy for him. If you have any idea how close we are to the second coming, you realize that all God did was hit the pause button on his life, and he will soon hit play again. And when he hits play again, he will be resurrected, caught up into the clouds, and join him. Is that a sad thing? Well, that's not a sad thing. I mean, obviously, we feel the pain of loss as we're going through our daily lives. It's just a reminder that this is not our home. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share uh, with our church family here in Wilcox. Lord, I ask that you will take a coal from your altar and anoint my lips, that you will hide me in the cross, that it not be my words that are spoken, but yours. Please open our hearts and our minds to receive this message, and thank you so much for this Sabbath day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, something ironic happened. Um, last night, or the night before, I woke up, or I was woken up, about 2.30 in the morning. And I had this feeling that there was a rattlesnake inside of my trailer. It was terrifying. And I couldn't go back to sleep, and it started just gnawing at me. There's a rattlesnake in my trailer, and I thought, there's no rattlesnake in here. There's no way it got in here. But I had this feeling that there was this impending danger, and it came as the feeling of a rattlesnake. And so as I'm contemplating this, I'm realizing that um, I was woken up for maybe another purpose. But the sense of danger was still there. There was something urgent to what was going on in the middle of the night. Now, I'm giving a sermon series in Tucson, um, which is going through the mystery school religions and its impact in our world today. And I'm kind of laying a foundation, uh, building up to um, current events. But what happened was, um, I, through discussion of some folks in, uh, in Tucson, I realized that they really didn't have a fundamental understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. So the idea is to bring some of those things forward. Now, I realize in, in this group here, there's a little bit more of a present truth feel, so that isn't, isn't necessarily required, but um, I, I digress. So um, the feeling that I had, I started thinking about the sermon series, and all of a sudden I was getting this sermon. 
And I thought, well, oh, okay, he's giving me the structure, the outline for the next part of my sermon series for Tucson. Just makes sense. And so I jotted down some notes, and I was like, that's a great framework. That's, I'm going to use that and, uh, for the next part, uh, which is going to be part four. And, and maybe at some time in the future, um, I'll be invited to give that series here if you want it. Um, but anyways, uh, I started jotting down some notes, went back to sleep. Um, it was kind of a late night for me the, the following, the day previous, because I, I work out of town and I drive and I'm all over the place, so I got home kind of late and uh, I was kind of tired, so I, I ended up kind of sleeping in and I was a little bit lazy. I really didn't get going until close to noon. And I turned my phone on and my phone is just blown up with all these text messages of that we've lost Alan. I had text messages from uh, my dear friends that I'm staying with, like, call me, it's Im immediate, like, what's going on? So I'm thinking, what is going on? Like, what did I miss? Um, I start responding back, and they, uh, Diane says to me, uh, Uncle Nestor is looking for somebody to speak tomorrow, or Sabbath. And I, I said, really? So that message that I was given the night as a warning message was not for church in Tucson. So I just wanted to share that with you. That's a little bit of the backstory. Um, but I believe that when you are earnest and you put yourself in a position to be used by the Holy Spirit, He will use you. It is cooperation, and that is essentially the heart and soul of t I'm, I feel like I'm losing you sometimes. Am I losing you? Is there a little bit of a short going on here? Am I, okay, let's see. I'm jiggling things. I'm moving things. If I look over here, oh, I'm still there. Okay, all right, so. The Canadian court. When I, I hope this brings to mind some images. I didn't have a lot of time to put a lot of images in this, uh, in this sermon. This is going to be more of a PowerPoint, a lot of reading, but we're, we're going to get through it, I promise. Um, but the Chaldean court, if you have, uh, let's go back in time. Let's pretend like we are in the Babylonian era. Okay, and so we are the, basically taking the place of the Hebrew worthies. We are in the court, surrounded by a heathen system of worship, a heathen system of diet, a heathen system of uh, governmental agencies. Everything is counter to what we are used to hearing, used to living in. We are now finding ourselves in a foreign land. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 12, it's when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Abominations. So it's not just a contrary system. It's an actual abomination. Something we are to avoid at all costs. Right? There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter pass through the fire, that useth divination or an observer of times, astrology, or an enchanter, or a witch or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard. How many of you have ever watched Fantasia? Disney. What's Mickey doing? He's a wizard. But it's okay, it's for kids, right? No, it's an abomination. That's what this says. Or a necromancer, somebody who's talking to evil to spirits that are pretending to be people that you knew when they were alive. Right, but they're not. Uh, so, th so this is a warning. If they were that person, would it be such a big deal? No. This is, you're actually talking to, to spirits. You're actually going into the mystery school religions that are surrounding you looking for answers. This is why it says don't do it. Don't be a part of their system. Stay away from it. There's supposed to be a difference between you and them. Let's keep looking. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Can it happen to us? So the question is, are we saved by name, or are we saved by putting into practice the principles of God? So then what is the definition then? Let's, let's keep going. Daniel 1, 9 through 21, we know these verses, we know these stories, but let's just kind of go through it. 
Starting in verse 9, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink for Why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head before the king. Listen, I know you guys are kosher, but we don't do kosher. Right? I don't want you to... You're risking my life if you eat the way that you're saying that you ate in Israel. Look, I can't do that. We're talking about life and death here. But what happens? Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Just give me ten, ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest, and do, deal with thy servants. So try it. We know these verses, right? Verse 14, So he consecrated them to this man, and he proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children the portion of the king's meat. Isn't it interesting when you become a vegan, everybody that you tell you became a vegan is now an expert on protein. <laughs> Everywhere you go, you, they might not know anything about health. You ask them, do you know anything about health? Nope. I just became a protein. I can't do that. I can't give that up. But what was the original diet? In the Garden of Eden, you carry your shotgun, and if you see something good, you shoot it. That's not it. Well, that's exactly what the world is telling you to do. Are we surrounded? Are we in the Chaldean court? Do we have to be called before a king to be in the Chaldean court? Yeah. All right, we'll switch. How about that? Is that better? All right, so now I'm not in and out. Okay. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appears. Okay. Then Melzer took away the portion of their meat and their wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So after he proved themselves to the eunuchs, these people that they already had a relationship with, they're like, man, that really worked. So then they step it up a notch and as for these four children, God gave them knowledge. So what happened? They're following in accordance to what they were taught is truth, and God gave them knowledge. Who gave them knowledge? Oh, we got to pay attention to this. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? How do we know that? How do we know that? It comes in here. A little bit of this goes a long way, right? And not only that, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So now we're getting into that supernatural realm. The Babylonians had one way of viewing it. God has another way of viewing it. Now at the end of the days, the king had said, had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found none, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore they stood before the king. That means they were in the king's court. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, so better than Mickey, and the astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first day, the first year of King Cyrus. So that is showing that his career was long because of what he was able to do. In Prophets and Kings, in the court of Babylon, page 485, the Spirit of Prophecy says this, At the court of Babylon were gathered representatives from all lands. Men of the highest talent, men, of the most, richly endowed, men most richly endowed with natural gifts, and possessed of the broadest culture that the world could bestow, yet among them all, the Hebrew youth were without peer. In physical strength and beauty and mental vigor and literary attainment, they stood unrivaled. The erect form, the firm elastic step, the fair countenance, the undimmed sentence, the senses, the untainted breath, all were so many certificates of good habits, insignia of the nobility in which nature honors those who are obedient to her laws. 
Now in the Chaldean court, the king surrounded himself with what? The magicians, the sorcerers, all these people who had a way of in, being in touch with something supernatural for inspiration to give them wisdom and insight. The life that these Hebrew worthies were living was a life of obedience which put them on a path, a narrow path of understanding. That means by walking that path, the Lord was able to endow them in a way that Satan could not mimic. Do we see that here? Ten times better than anyone else that the king had surrounded himself with. Now, are we weird? It's okay, be honest. Are we weird? Do we eat weird? We dress weird? We talk weird? We call each other brother and sister? We're not related. But we're on a path. And we know something. It puts us ten times ahead of what's going on in this world. Now, today, it is so easy to talk to people about the New World Order. I can walk up to a perfect stranger. This happened to me in Los Angeles. I was invited to speak in Los Angeles, and one of the things we did after church services, we went and we passed out great controversies on the beach. Good excuse to go to the beach, right? So we're passing out great controversies on the beach. We prayed. And as we were walking along, we noticed there was uh, a couple of guys, three guys actually, um, that had a tent set up and they were just kind of lounging on the beach. And somehow we drifted towards them. It was unintentional. We asked when we prayed that the Lord would put us in touch with people who would be receptive to the message. Who would be receptive to the book. So as we were walking, this gentleman and I make eye contact. We start talking. He says to me, I knew you guys were coming over here. I knew that. Is the Holy Spirit working? The conditions of this planet, as dramatic as they are, are creating a huge opportunity for us to finish the work. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Spirit of Prophecy continues, they followed rules of life that could not fail to give them strength of intellect. How do we clear up the frontal lobe? Medical missionaries, help me. How do we clear up the frontal lobe? Plant-based diet. Plant-based diet, thank you. Plant-based diet. What did Daniel and the Hebrew worthies eat? Well, how'd they get the protein? Beans, rice, lentils, legumes, whatever was around, right? And you have to imagine that the king probably had a decent garden. Because he probably saw them as ingredients to go into his food. They saw them as the food. And, you know, if you were in the king's court, you had a wine or a cup bearer to make sure that they tested everything, they drank everything that you ate to make sure nobody poisoned you. And also, you know, does it taste good? You know, if you don't like it, I'm not going to like it. You send it back. So you're getting top of the line produce. You're getting top. Let you say he got that he that they are shopping in the organic section. Top of the line everything. And what is it doing? The fact of the matter is, it's doing nothing. The truth of the matter is, they are in obedience with God's will, and He is blessing them. They are being endowed through blessing through obedience. Okay. They sought to acquire knowledge for the purpose for one purpose, that they might honor God. They realized that in order to stand as rep representatives of true religion among the false religions of heathenism, they must have a clearness of intellect and must perfect a Christian character. And God himself was their teacher. Constantly praying, conscientiously studying, keeping in touch with the unseen, they walked with God as did Enoch. Put a pin in that. This is very important. 
Do we see the parallel here between the life that, that they lived, the life that Enoch lived, and the life that we're called to live? We're going to look at that. Jude 14 and 15 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Look at the words that are spoken here in Jude. Prophesied. I have it underlined there. Prophesied. And that the Lord cometh. What was Enoch endowed with? The spirit of prophecy. And a focus on the second coming. Does that sound like anybody you know? Is that also something that Daniel had in common? Did they have gift of prophecy? Were they following in obedience? Was, there this, was the prophecy that, Daniel, that was given to Daniel, was it about future events? A stone carved out, not by human hands, that smashes a statue that surrounds the earth? Boy, that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Manuscript 36. Written in 1902, this is Letters and Manuscripts, Volume 17, again by the Spirit of Prophecy. Enoch was a what? Oh, so he was on the church wreck and he paid tithe. He was part of the board? So what is the definition of an Adventist? That's it. That's it. What was that? Seventh-day Sabbath? Well, of course they kept the Seventh-day Sabbath, right? They were Jews, so they didn't, they didn't defer from that. The second coming of Christ? Okay, what else makes an Adventist? Spirit of prophecy. Bingo, you nailed it. So it's more than having your name associated with a particular denomination. Is that what we just said? Now, does that mean to say that if you're an Adventist that doesn't do anything for you, doesn't give you a body that you can worship in, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is there is a difference between having your name on the books and having your, God's name written in your heart. Amen. Enoch walked with God and was taken. That's a representative for us. The Hebrew woman is standing in the court having to stand when everyone was told to bow down is our responsibility. We are at that time. All you have to do is look around at the temperature of this world, take it, whether it's in the economy, whether it's the pandemic, um, anything, any facet of this world, and you will take, take the temperature and you will realize that we are at the very end of time. There isn't a lot of time. I've had people tell me, oh, 15 years, 10 years. No, 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 no. We don't know the day nor the hour. I'm going to tell you this. It's close. Everything that's happening now is building upon the next thing, is building upon the next thing, is building upon the next thing. They have not brought us back. Thank God that Ducey didn't put us back into another mandatory mask mandate and the whole thing. Thank God we're not in California where we're having all these restrictions. I really believe the hand of God was moving on that to give us just a little bit more time because we have a work to do. But right now, because of these things that are happening, people are questioning. People want to know. And we are in the court of the Chaldeans as a witness. Because we eat weird, we dress weird, we talk weird, and we go to church on the wrong day. We are not Babylonian. And we need to separate more and more. Enoch was an Adventist. He carried the minds of the people forward to the great day of God when Christ will come the second time. Imagine that. The flood hadn't even happened yet. And he's talking about the second coming. Boy, you want to talk about sounding crazy. To judge everyone's work. That's so important. To, people want to focus on the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Understand that the love of God is prophecy warning you that there's coming an end. That is the love of God. That's very much a part of it. If I don't love you, and there's a rattlesnake in the middle of the floor, I'm not going to tell you about it. 
But I love you, so I'm telling you there's a rattlesnake. And you need to be watched and be careful about it. You need to pay attention. And people will get mad at people like me who will tell you that there's a rattlesnake. And they say, oh, you're, you're making such a big deal out of nothing. You don't have any faith. But I'm telling you, if you keep going, you're going to get bit by that rattlesnake. Like Enoch, Enoch, we must walk with God, bringing the will into submission to his will. Key, key. We must be willing to go where Jesus leads, willing to suffer for his dear sake, in seeking to save the souls for whom Christ had died, in conquering difficulties, and in keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, we reveal the genuineness of our religion. It's not the name. It's how we behave. And I can't make it up. It has to be indwelling. We just read that the will must be brought into subjection with the will of God. Imagine what a high honor that is to cooperate with God at these the last days. What a high calling that is. Faithful Christians, do not seek the easiest place, the lightest burdens. They are found where the work is hardest, where their help is most needed, in the Chaldean court. Will the real Adventists please stand up? These are the real Adventists, right? Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We know these verses by heart. Revelation 19, 10. And I fell at my feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. There's the definition the question is, do we have it? It's an individual calling. Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through 19 says this, Wherefore, at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. We have been living amongst these people, and there's going to be a time where we are not going to be favored. My question to you is, when do you make your appeal? When they hate you or before then? Uh, both. But right now, it's so easy to be able to begin a conversation with people who are actually questioning, you know, things just aren't the way they used to be in 1980. I remember a different country. I remember a different way of life. We didn't hate each other. It was easy to go down the street and just be an American. Now you say stuff like that and they call you all kinds of names. What, what, what kind of country do you live in where you can't even say your own pledge? A nation divided will fall. Is America about to fall? According to spirit prophecy it is. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And, though, and whosoever falleth not down and worship, worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who thou hast set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon. These are high ranking. Trustworthy. Because they held the principle. Let's see if they move from that point, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Which, by the way, that's a badge of honor. They refuse to go along. Are we being told to go along? Can you think of some issues right now that we're being told to go along? You need to go along with it. For the, for the benefit of all the rest of us, look what you're doing. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, and the spirit of prophecy says satanic, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? I'll give you a second chance. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack, but the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast in the same hour into the midst of, the, of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody said something bad about my mom, it's infuriating. But I can say, get mad at my mom, I can say the same thing. It doesn't bug me. Right? But when somebody else says it, all of a sudden, you have crossed the line, dude. So this is what Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego say. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. You don't cross the line. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, I will not get the shot. I will not wear a mask. I will not go along to get along. I will stand on principle because I don't worship your gods and I don't see your kingdom as the kingdom that I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for a different kingdom. O oh, king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We are facing a national Sunday law. They are preparing a world that will beg for an answer. It is surrounding us today. The crucial point that we have been talking about for over 170 years as Adventists is now coming to fruition. What are we doing? We must stand as Enoch. We must stand as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We must be true Adventists like they were. Not like we are. A change must take place. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the cooperation of man and God is a divine institution and it is nothing to be taken lightly. We are Adventists, not because of a name, but because we know the truth and we walk this path. It makes us ten times a better place than the whole world that is guessing at numbers and how are we going to provide for ourselves and what kind of solution we should offer. We know what's coming. Revelation 18, 1 through 4 says this, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened by, with his glory. Sorry, I forgot a word there. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon. This is Revelation. Is Babylon around right now? No. This is talking about our very situation. We are in the court of the Chaldeans right now. Those messages and warnings that were, that were given to us through example of the Hebrew worthies is the life we are to live. Saying Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird and necromancers and sorcery and magicians and pharmacia. That's what that means. When we read the story of how the dragon swept with his tail a third of the stars of heaven and brought them down here, this is the cage of every... These are the birds. These are the unclean things. And what do they bring with them? The abominations. This world is in love with it. Who are we in love with? Or who should we be in love with? It's no higher honor on earth than to tie your will to the will of God, to be grafted in. 
For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. How many nations, by the way? So does it matter if it's Trump or Biden? It doesn't? It's not the end of the world? It seems like it. I want you to understand some that's division. That's a satanic ploy. There is no left and right. It's the same party. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That's not good. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Pot's legal here now, right? Oops. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye not receive of her plagues. We just read about the four winds. Now is the time when we make a decision. Not later. Not after the Sunday law. Now. I realize I'm preaching to the choir. But the fact of the matter is we need to be galvanized and we need to have a zeal. Sometimes going over these things just to refresh it in our minds gives us that inspiration, what we talked about in Sabbath school today. How do we come out? These are just a few things. This is not comprehensive. Constantly praying. We just read this. Conscientiously studying, keeping in touch with the unseen, they walked with God as did Enoch. Every minute, every day, every hour. Consecrating ourselves daily to the work that the Lord has for us. We may have to lay aside our own plans for something, excuse me, that the Lord has set up for us and who wants us to do that day? Like being woke up in the middle of the night to give a sermon. His grace is given to work in us to will and to do, but never as a substitute for our own effort cooperation. True success in any line of work is not the result of chance or accident or destiny. It is the outworking of God's providences, the reward of faith and, and discretion of virtue and perseverance. Fine mental qualities and higher moral tone are not the result of accident. God gives opportunities. Success depends on the use made of them. Cooperation. When I started watching Ernie's channel, he said, we didn't come out here to drink lemonade and just sit around and wait for Jesus to come. We have to be active. It's going to be different for me than it is for you. We have different talents. But of our talents, we are required to give with usury. We are standing in the Chaldean court. We are surrounded by all these things. We must separate. That's part of country living. That's part of the message. That the Lord wishes to do a work in us that he cannot do while we are tethered to the world. He's asking us to, what? Come out. He will, and here's the magic word, cooperate with how many? All who strive to do His will. If you got nothing of what's been said today except for that, job done. And by the impartation of His Spirit, He will strengthen every true purpose, every noble resolution. Those who walk in the path of obedience will encounter many hindrances. Strong, subtle influences may bind them to the world, but the Lord is able to render futile every agency that works for the defeat of His chosen ones. In His strength, whose strength? Strength. They may overcome every temptation, conquer every difficulty. Like three Hebrew worthies who refused to bow down. Like Enoch, who at a time when it was absolutely insane to say so, was talking about a second coming. The passions are to be controlled by the will, which is itself to be under the control of God. 
The kingly power of reason sanctified by divine grace is to bear sway in the life. Intellectual power, physical stamina, and the length of life depend on immutable laws. How did the Hebrew worthies become ten times more intelligent? Because they knew this. Do we know this? Amen. Through obedience to these laws, man may stand conqueror of himself, which, by the way, we are our worst enemy. Conqueror of his own inclinations, conqueror of principalities and powers, of the rulers of darkness in this world, and of spiritual wickedness in high places. They can't touch you. Ten times greater. Hold, 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 hold. Revelation 7, 1 through 3, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given, to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Do we see the winds beginning to blow? What's about to happen? The ceiling. The question is, where are we in our walks? Are we Adventists because of our name? Or are we Adventists because we incorporated the principles of God? There's a difference. Sister White says this, And I saw four angels who had a work to do in the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands with a voice of deep pity, cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from, the, from God, who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw another angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, Hold, 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 hold! Until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with what? And cares. But I got a car payment. What do I do about that? I saw that some minds are led away from present truth and the love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books. Others are filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat and drink and wear. Some are looking far too, off, or too far off for the coming of the Lord. No, 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 no. no. It's, it, I know it's bad, but you know, things like this come and go. Time has continued a few years longer than they expected. Therefore, they think that it may continue a few more years. And in this way, their minds are being led from present truth. Out after the world. In these things, I saw a great danger. For if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is what? Ooh. Wait a minute. What was Enoch doing? He was walking with God. His will was intertwined. Every moment, every day, he was surrendering. It's easy, the subtlety that, with which the devil works to draw us away. <laughs> Present truth is shut out, and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. Is it one or the other? It's kind of cut and dry, isn't it? It's pretty black and white. We will either fill ourselves with the things of this world or we will fill ourselves with the things of God. One of them gets translated, the other one does not. I saw that the time for Jesus 
to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and that time can last but a very little longer. What leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. My dear brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually, and let them crowd out the worldly thoughts and cares. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act holy in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and will soon be over. Now is the time while the four angels are holding back the four winds to make our calling and election sure. What a blessing it is to be born at this time, right? How many prophets Righteous people have waited for this time. There is an opportunity for each of us. God is calling us today. We are standing in the court of the Chaldeans whether you realize it or not. But soon that time is about to be pinched a little bit shorter. We'll end with this. This is the words of Christ. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak, because you've been walking with me this whole time, right? For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father, which speaketh in you. There was a missionary. I believe he was a Baptist missionary. Well over 100 years ago. And he went into a hostile land. And before he went, he was asked, is it worth it? His response was, A man is no fool to give up that which he can never keep for that which he can never lose. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we are keenly aware of the time that we're in, of our need for you, Please, Lord, help us to, to surrender more fully. Please help us to examine ourselves through your lens that we may place our sins upon your altar. Not just for our sakes, but for the work that needs to be done. Lord, we want to cooperate. We want to be servants. We want to be filled. We want to spread the truth. Lord, we want to be your definition of Adventist. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for the opportunity to fellowship. May these words not be my words, but the words of the Spirit. May they go with us. May our minds be molded and shaped by the working of the Holy Spirit. May our characters develop into the characters that will be ours for eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for these words. Now I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Maybe you girls can come up and help me sing the benediction song. The Lord